<laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I historically have a problem remembering that, even though I have sticky notes everywhere. So um, thank you. Uh, so yes, we are recording this and we will have this and all of our webinars uh, from the Compass for Caregivers series um, are available on the ESPC website. So uh, without further ado, just a, a quick mention, uh, we are on a Zoom webinar tonight. Uh, we cannot see you or hear you. Our other speakers will join uh, us um, any minute. Actually, folks, if you want to go ahead and put your screens on, that would be great. Um, as our panelists come on the screen, I just want to ask our attendees, uh, take a look at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, you can hover over it if it's dark, and you should see a toolbar pop up. You'll see a function called chat. Uh, on mine, it says chat, and it also has that little uh, comic strip um, dialog box uh, icon. That's how you'll communicate with us. And I really encourage you to put your questions into the chat box. Uh, we will share them with our guests, our panelists, uh, and get you the answers that you need. Um, I also will give a shout out to my co-hosts who are behind the screen, uh, who are keeping an eye on the chat. So if you're having any technical issues or have any general senior care questions, they can answer them as well. So I am really happy to welcome my colleagues and friends uh, to the panel tonight. I'm going to give them an introduction and we'll be sharing their information at the end of the presentation as well. So. Um, uh, on my screen, I'll start from left to right. We have Angela Martin, who's the owner of Shepherd Staff in Home Care. We have Ty Tawney from Home Call, sorry, Ty, uh, Home Call Home Health Care. Chris King from Bayada Home Health Care. Uh, Troy Rudy from Assisting Hands Home Care. Patty Smith from Home Instead Home Care. Eileen McLaughlin from Right at Home in Home Care and Desiree Dimapan from Ameticis Home Health Care. So um, all of these folks have been a part of this community for a very, very long time. They've been a part of this industry for a long time. So I know you're gonna get some great uh, factual information. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. Um, Desiree, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, Desiree, can you help uh, folks understand the difference between home care and home health care? Yeah, definitely. Um, so basically, home health is a service that provides a skilled need. Um, we provide treatment, education, and support for patients, um, whether you are returning home from a hospital stay, post-surgical surgical care, managing a serious or chronic um, disease, or dealing with multiple diagnoses. Um, in order to receive home health services, a patient must be under the care of a medical provider, and that medical provider must provide an order. Um, if there is a skilled need in place for nursing or therapy services, a patient may be eligible um, if they are considered homebound. Um, so Medicare defines being homebound as a taxing effort to leave the home. Um, services are provided on an intermittent basis. And it's very common for home health agencies to work and collaborate with home care agencies. Um, so with home health, it will be covered by um, insurance, most insurances. Um, home care is not typically covered by um, insurance. It is out of pocket. And it's just really important to look into long-term care policies, um, private health insurance, VA benefits, or any type of resources in, um, in the community. So Desiree, can you explain a little bit more of the services that one could expect from home health care? It looks like we might be having a little bit of trouble with Desiree's audio and video. So um, we will come back to Desiree. Are you there? All right, we'll come back to Desiree in a minute. Yeah. We've got, it's a bad audio connection, Desiree. Um, let's have Ty go ahead and then I'll come back to you in a few minutes. You might wanna log out and come back on and see if that makes a difference. Um, Ty, let's see, where's Ty? All right, Ty, can you tell us a little bit more about how home health care gets started? Okay. So he um, consists of um, nurses, physical therapy, physical therapists. What just happened? 
<laughs> All right, Desiree, I'm going to have you hold off. Your audio is not working real well, so we're going to let Ty go ahead, okay? Can you hear me? I just lost everything, too. Yep, Ty, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can see you, too, so. Uh, oh, okay. I'm glad you can because I can't see anything. <laughs> Um, so, Ty, how does somebody get started with home health care? Well, home health care can get started in a couple of different ways. The first way is a referral from your primary care physician if you've not been in the hospital. If you've been in the hospital or subacute rehab, it also can be started from there. What it is is the social worker from the facility or the case manager discharge planner from the hospital will arrange things for you with the order from the physician following you at that facility or in the hospital. However, you still do have to have a primary care physician to sign the orders once we get started with the home health. And Hatai, does the hospital or the rehab, do they choose the, the, the agency for you? Do, you? do you have a voice in how that gets chosen? Yes, you do, um, especially with Medicare. Everyone has a choice to choose their home health agency. Now, I will say with some of the insurances and some of the managed Medicares, if, they, if you go with an agency, what is called within their network, you don't usually have a big copay. But if you go with an agency that they don't recommend or that's not in their network, then you will have a large copay. So it's highly recommended to go with, you know, someone that's in network. And sometimes some of the insurances will request the referral to be sent to them for them to send out to a home health agency. It depends totally on the insurance. And I assume that the agencies, you, you all have staff that are pretty savvy in working with the insurances and understand some of those nuances. Correct. Perfect. Um, so Ty, I, I wanna go back. It, it seems clear to me that if you're in the hospital or rehab, that's pretty straightforward, but do you have to have any special conditions for your, pri can your primary care doctor order home health care for anybody? Do they yes, have they certain can. conditions? As long as you have um, some illness that needs to be followed, like say if you have congestive heart failure, um, COPD, any of those things, as long as you qualify for the home health, your physician can order the home health. You do not have to be in the hospital or the subacute facility for us to get an order for home health. As long as you've seen the physician within 90 days to, uh, prior to us starting the care or within 30 days after. So would somebody call their physician's office to get a referral started or would they call the home health agency first? They should call the physician office first and tell them why they want the home health and explain to them what they need. Okay. <clears throat> Um, thanks, Ty. Um, You're Desiree, welcome. Desiree, let's try it again. Um, nope, that didn't work. Sorry, folks. <laughs> All right, Desiree, can you speak a little bit about what services come under home health? Yeah, so the clinical team would consist of nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, medical social workers, and speech therapy. Um, so when you're looking at nursing services, um, you can look at um, a nurse providing care for med management, um, disease process teaching, um, education, oxygen use and safety. Nurses can also provide wound care if needed, um, IV therapy. Um, home care, home health agencies can also provide routine lab work if there is a skilled need in place, um, if, there's, if you're already on service. Um, for nursing. Um, for physical therapy, um, the therapist would work with you on fall prevention, gait training, and balance training. Um, for occupational therapy, balance transfers, visual impairments, and compensation. Um, medical social work is really important. Um, the social worker would work with the patient and the family to identify resources um, in the community and financial assistance programs. So basically, for the clinical team in a home health setting is to um, avoid preventable uh, hospitalizations and to also keep um, older adults at home for as long as possible. Perfect. Thanks, Desiree. All right, Chris, I'm going to go to you. Hi, good evening, everyone. 
Hi, Chris. Thank you. Chris, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question because Desiree's um, audio was going out again, but can somebody, she talked about the nursing and the skilled therapy services. Can somebody get somebody to come help bathe their mom uh, through home health? Home health does offer a home health aid benefit. It's limited and you have to qualify. It's not every day, all day service. They don't do the laundry. They don't do the housekeeping, the cooking, those kinds of things. Basically, they come out to do bathing, dressing, and a um, little bit of um, personal care as far as they're allowed only to do certain creams, no wound care or treatments like that. So, so the home health care doesn't last for a long time, right? That's not designed to be an ongoing caregiving service. How, how, who decides when it ends? Who decides how long and how much service you get? So there are several things that can come into place that will end home health. Of course, it's always the patient's choice. If they are no longer in need of home health services, they've met all of their goals, they're maxed out in what we are able to do at home and they need to go to an outpatient setting, or if a, the unfortunate situation where they're no longer able to meet any of the goals that, or they choose not to meet their goals, then services have to be ended at that point as well. So a question that we often get if people want to continue service or have more service, can they have another agency, a home care agency in the house at the same time? Yes, of course. You can have both home health and a home care agency at the same time. They're both not through the same payment entity, and we collaborate with each other to take care of the patient at home to make sure they're safe at home. Home health can teach the home care aides how to work with the client to make sure that they're safe, to do their exercises, the um, easiest way for dressing, bathing, to make the patient as independent as possible. So it sounds like that's actually a good idea to get one on board before the other ends so that there's some, some layover and training and support. Yes, definitely. Excellent. And so is home health care something one and done? You get it and then you've used that up. Can you get it again? And, and is, do you have to meet certain qualifications to get it again? There's no cap on home health. You have to qualify. There's certain criteria, one of which someone mentioned, I believe Desiree already, you have to be homebound, which means it's difficult and taxing to leave the home. It does not mean that you don't have transportation. Unfortunately, Medicare will not pay for you to have home health just because you don't have a ride to an outpatient center. But if you are having difficulty leaving the home, you only leave for certain things like getting your hair done, going to the grocery store, the doctor's office, medical appointments, then you, know, you may qualify for home health. Perfect. Um, Ty, I would like to bring you back on the screen if we could for a second. Um, we've had a question, how does a home health care agency work with an HMO organization like Kaiser? And any of you, are there affiliated home health services associated with Kaiser here in Frederick County? Well, like with Kaiser, Kaiser contracts with certain home health agencies. So that's one of the insurances that you need to go with someone that's in their network. Got it. It's the same way with the HMOs. A lot of the HMOs contract with certain home health agencies. So do any of you know to help this person out? Um, do any of the agencies um, work with Kaiser? Any of the Frederick agencies work with Kaiser? Do you know that? I believe Bayana with Chris does. I believe they're the Bay, uh, Kaiser agency in yes. Frederick County. We are, and I believe also Frederick Home Health is another one. Correct. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, so again, our uh, guests in the audience, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. I hope that uh, Chris and Ty and Desiree were able to give a little bit of information about home health care. So uh, specific care, time limited, covered by your insurance, um, but with specific goals in mind. 
uh, and specific parameters. Um, the other type of care is called home care. And Angela, I'm wondering if you can uh, give us some information about um, how, what, how home care works, how it gets started. Okay, well, getting started with home care is as simple as making a phone call. Um, there are a number of great home care agencies in Frederick. So uh, you can do some internet research to find out uh, what they are, but just make a phone call and schedule an appointment for someone to come out and meet with you, um, or they might do an intake over the phone. And then uh, care can be started fairly quickly in most cases. It just, it depends. Uh, normally the home care agency is going to want to know what kind of services you need, uh, what your current situation is, and then they would match you up with a caregiver that can fulfill those needs and is qualified to provide the level of care you need. Angela, can you talk a little bit about the types of care, uh, different types of care that a home care agency could provide? Okay. Um, well, first we can provide assistance with what's called ADLs, activities of daily living. And that's things like getting out of bed in the morning, getting dressed, uh, doing your personal grooming, um, preparing a meal um, or, or um, you know, get, getting food. They can help with transfers if you need help getting out of bed or getting into a wheelchair. So that's the personal care part. But then home care can go beyond that as well. And they can help with housekeeping tasks. They can provide transportation to doctor appointments or to uh, grocery shopping or other errands. Um, th they can do um, meal preparation. And they can provide companionship, uh, some memory care, uh, really helping people to stay safe and, and to uh, remember to do things they need to do. Uh, medication reminders are a very important part of, of home care as well. Perfect. Thanks, Angela. Um, Troy, I wonder if you would jump on now and give us some information about how quickly can somebody expect services to start? Sure. First of all, good evening, everybody. In terms of how soon you can start, of course, it depends on our caregiver availability, but most of our agencies out there in the Frederick area, we can begin services the same day that we receive your call to provide care. And how does somebody get that services um, uh, started? Do they need a doctor's order to do that or do they just call the agency? They do not need a doctor's order. Following up on Angela, simply give us a call. We understand what your needs are. Uh, we find out what your address is. We find out what ADLs are required. And then we begin setting up services in our schedule. Troy, can I... Can I pick and choose and have exactly the hours that I want? Are there limits, minimums, maximums? Well, every agency is a little bit different. So there's a variety out there. You can do one, two, three, four hours to 24 hours a day. We recommend four hours per day. We have found through our research that, that four hours per day really provides that connectivity between the client and the caregiver. They really get to know each other and that's really important in terms of, you know, their mental stability, getting to know the folks, getting to know the agency itself. So that works out really well, we found. Um, so folks in the audience, if you are making a list, uh, I often get asked questions about choosing agencies. And I think that's a really important question to put on your list to ask when you're making those calls. Does the agency that you're calling have a minimum? Um, and or a maximum or limits in, the, in the, the amount of time that you would have. So a uh, great question, Troy, thank you. Um, how about, you know, can you do like just a little in the morning to get out of bed and a little in the night to go back to bed? Mom's fine in the middle of the day. Can you do that? Uh, abs absolutely. I think all the agencies fly in Frederick. I know that we do have a wake up call service for which we, we get there. We wake up the client, uh, we get them up out of bed, we get them dressed, groomed, cleaned up and set up for breakfast. And then, you know, like you said before is, you know, there could be a big gap during the day and then we come back into the evenings to get them all settled and back into bed to start the cycle all over again. So we commonly all do that. Perfect, thanks Troy. Patty, I'm going to ask you to jump on now and give us some information about cost and how how it works. Okay, thank you, um, Christina. So we um, 
Market research in this area has shown that um, there's the hourly rate can vary from 24 to $35 an hour, and that would um, be determined by the level of care needed, whether it's um, strictly home helper companionship type services or more personal care, and that would also include um, couples care for folks that both, um, both folks would be taken care of in the home. So um, that's the, the general air hourly rate in the area. And then also other fees that can come into play are when um, nurses have to come out to do assessments, there would be fees for that. And then also um, mileage fees if the caregiver is using their personal vehicle to run errands and, and take folks out for appointments and things like that, there can be a mileage charge added on. So that would be another good um, thing to put on your question list is to understand as you're calling out, calling the different agencies, understand what their fee structures are like and what extra fees there might be. Patty, does insurance ever pay for home care? This type of home care um, is not unfortunately covered um, through Medicare or Medicaid or private insurance. Um, so we often, um, whenever we're talking to, especially adult children who are calling for parents, we do always explain that and then we um, let them know it couldn't be paid for out of pocket. And then also we always encourage them to find out from the parents or you know other the, the loved ones who need the care if there is a long-term care policy in place. I think Desiree had mentioned those earlier because a lot of times the adult children don't even know they exist because you know mom or dad have been paying on it, you know, for they opened it up 50 years ago and it's in a drawer somewhere. So we do always ask them to look into that because we have some folks who have excellent policies that will cover um, several hours of care a day, so. Excellent, that's a great uh, reminder to everyone. If you have your own long-term care insurance policy, make sure your kids or your family know you have it. Mm -hmm. um, and if your parents are still able uh, to give you that kind of information, find out now before they need it so you know where the policy is and what's included in it. Um, thank you. Um, so that's really expensive. Um, to be frank, right? And not everybody can afford that. Are there any other low cost alternatives? Um, there are, um, you know, I'm sure there are some agencies that um, you could find that would be um, possibly lower in cost. Um, the, the reason for some of these higher fees are um, that these companies are doing a lot of the vetting for um, that you would, you know, want done background checks, driving checks, reference checks, um, and they're also licensed, bonded, and insured. So that can be a reason um, that that the costs are a little on the higher side. Um, so yes, that, that is something. And um, hopefully that answered your question. I just wanted to jump on with something that Eileen had said the other day. Um, not that that's always the case. Sometimes folks have trusted neighbors and things like, you know, folks like that who can come in and help them. And, and you know, it's wonderful if they have folks that are trusted in their life that they can come in you know, provide that type of care. So um, it's not to say that that's a negative, but that, right. that is the reason for more of the higher. Perfect. And we'll have Eileen talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Eileen, actually, why don't we have you come on now? Um, okay. Hello. Uh, perfect. Eileen, thank you. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to um, flip flop your questions because Patty really segued right into that. Why should somebody choose or why sh would somebody choose an agency over uh, the internet or the newspaper sure. or an ad they saw at the grocery store? Sure. And we all want to get services at a lower cost. You can't blame anybody for doing that. So when people look at having someone care for their loved one in their home, it's not uncommon for them to check with family, friends, somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. And as Patty mentioned, you know, every now and then a situation like that will work out okay. Um, sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it really doesn't. So one of the reasons to go with a reputable home care agency like the ones that are represented here tonight, I'm happy to be here with my colleagues, um, is really safety. Um, an agency is going to place someone in your home, a caregiver who is bonded, licensed, and insured. The agency is, um, 
you know, licensed through the state of Maryland. Home care agencies are called residential service agencies. So we go through quite a licensing process. The caregiver, before they ever walk into your home, there were background checks done, drug tests, training, ongoing training, interviews. They're actually employees of the agency. Um, so for a little bit more money, that safety and protection is, is really vital for the care of your loved one. Perfect. Eileen, let's talk a little bit about you've hired an aide. What can an aide do in the house? Are there, are there rules and limits to what the aide can do for your loved one? Yes, and I love this topic. And it's so confusing, isn't it? What can a home health aide do? What can a home care aide do? It's, it's just really confusing. So tonight is maybe the beginning of, of you know, straightening out some of the confusion mm -hmm. in the community. A home care aide can do just about anything that your loved one is doing or needs to do in their home to stay well. So meal preparation, housekeeping, bathing, dressing, sorting out the mail, helping them with their pet care, and even transportation. Home health doesn't um, allow transportation, home care does. So we carry insurance um, for our caregivers. We look for proof of um, insurance from them. There, we, we check their driving license and history. And our caregivers are able to take um, your loved one on appointments. And those appointments can be mm, just visit to something really crucial like a man. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. so, um, so can it be something like really just for fun? Can they take my mom out for coffee or go to the library or Walmart? Yes, yes. Fun is a big part of thriving at home. So going to Walmart, going shopping, going to lunch, those are all really important things. And a lot of working adult children would love to be able to take their mom out or dad as much as they'd like, but can't. And so our caregivers sometimes have just regular visits and outings just for fun. So uh, that leads me to, so it is okay to hire someone, not, not necessarily to do the tasks, the dressing, bathing, but, but to engage my loved one in conversation, to play cards with them, to play Scrabble, to, to engage them? Yes, engagement is huge. I think Angela mentioned that about helping people with activities of daily living, and those are all important things, but oh my gosh, that, that conversation, um, sometimes it's just looking at photo albums. Sometimes it's going over the news, you know, over the news. We've had um, people want help with their, you know, computer skills. So yes, that, that sharing and social interaction is so important. Perfect. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute, but Angela, I'd like to bring you back on the screen if we could. I want to talk about safety and, and how do folks know that the caregiver in the home is, is safe? How do they know that that person won't take advantage? We all see crazy stories in the news that are pretty scary. Yeah. And that's another good reason for relying on an agency because we do the background checks. Uh, as Eileen said, we, we uh, do multiple ways of checking people and making sure that we feel safe. You know, we like to not hire anyone unless, you know, yeah, you know, unless I feel this is someone that I wouldn't <laughs> mind going to my parents. And, and I'm sure other agencies have the same high standards. So um, we also provide supervision. There are spot checks, you know, our nurse will go out or, or uh, a care manager will go out and visit clients while the caregiver is there. Uh, we make unannounced visits. So that's something that can provide an additional measure of safety. And, um, you know, we really, you know, we provide that ongoing training. We tell our caregivers, you know, expect there to be a camera. Uh, we encourage people uh, to use cameras in the home because uh, they're so easy nowadays to, to put in place. And that can give you an extra uh, layer of confidence as well. Uh, excellent, Angela, thank you. What, what if a caregiver just has a feeling that something isn't right? I assume that every agency is gonna respond quickly to a, a concern like that, right? Absolutely. It, it, uh, you would always, you know, you call the agency if you have any concerns at all about the caregiver. 
uh, or even if it's just a not a good personality fit. Sometimes the caregiver is not uh, doing anything wrong, but it might just not be the right person for a particular client. And so if you let the agency know that you just don't feel comfortable with this caregiver, they can try another caregiver and you know maybe it would be a better fit. Perfect. With that, Angela, I'm going to jump back to Troy to talk a little bit more about that. So I imagine that does happen sometimes, right? That the caregiver that the agency sends out just isn't a good match for the client. And what happens when that happens? That's correct. So when we typically, what we like to do when we start out with a new client, um, we like to have a caregiver be there at least two weeks because it gets that consistency of care that I'm quite sure because it's the first time somebody's actually been in their house. But you know, at the end of the day, if it's like one or two sessions into it and the client still is like this person, we don't match, uh, we just, you know, we don't talk well, variety of reasons. All of us on the call here itself, we will gladly exchange out another caregiver for somebody who may be better suited to that. But you know, with the in-home care, it's really a matchmaking game. So we all kind of go through the personalities and the traits and the hobbies of what our clients are and what they like to do. And we match that up to our caregivers to try to find that match. But as we just talked about, there's at times where even throughout all that, we still don't have a good match. And we'll be glad to replace that caregiver. Troy, what do agencies, what happens if I'm counting on somebody to come for my mom and they don't show or they cancel at the last minute? Um, what happens? Sure, good question. So yes, it does happen to all of us on occasion here itself. So in a good case scenario itself, our caregivers will give us a call and let us know that, hey, they had a family emergency going on and I'm not going to be able to make it in. What we all do is we will immediately go into action here and find somebody within our staff. We'll reach out to them, all of our caregivers, to find out who's available. We also have the opportunity within our staff that we can actually send a caregiver who's on board with our staff out to fill that shift if need be. So if I'm counting on somebody to be there, I can be pretty sure that somebody's going to come when they said they were going to be there. Somebody. That's, that's correct. And I'm pretty sure that probably any one of you or the owners of your company have been the person that fills in mm -hmm. when no one else could. So um, excellent. Thanks, Troy. Can I, can I answer Joanne's question? She's saying to usually try to keep the same caregiver. Uh, yes, we do. So a good key point is when you schedule schedule a consistent schedule week on a week off here itself so that we can provide that consistency with the caregiver. That's a great uh, question, Troy. And folks, I think that's an important question to ask when you're interviewing agencies. Will they send the same person? Will you have a different person every time? And uh, Troy makes a great uh, point. If you're only scheduling sporadically, it's probably unlikely that you can get the same person uh, as opposed to going uh, within every, every Monday at the same time kind of thing. Um, we had a, that is a correct. Um, yes. another, another question about medications. Can home care aides give medications? Angela, do you want to answer that one for us? Sure. Um, and the key word in the question was dispense. So um, home care aides cannot dispense medication. And that means taking it out of a prescription bottle and handing it to the client or telling the client you need to take this medication, this over-the-counter drug. Uh, home care aides are not allowed to do that, but that does not mean that we cannot assist with medications. So normally uh, what a lot of people will do is they'll have a pill reminder box and they'll fill it with the dosage for the day. And the, uh, the home care agency is informed of what medications are being taken and what time they need to be taken. So there's morning pills, maybe there's pills that are taken with lunch, maybe there's evening pills and the caregiver who is there uh, can uh, uh, remind the client to take medication. They can show them the pill reminder box. That they can open it up and they can take the pills out and offer a glass of water. A lot of people will put the medication in um, a little dessert dish or a shot glass that the uh, client is comfortable taking them out of because sometimes those, those little square pill reminder boxes are very hard to get the pills out of. So uh, there are different ways that the home care aid can help with that. Um, and it just requires a little bit of family involvement. 
If there is no family to fill a pill reminder box, you still want to talk to your home care agency because uh, they may be licensed to provide medication administration which basically would mean sending a qualified person, usually an RN, out to fill that pill reminder box. And then once it's filled, the home care aide who's there can assist with reminders and assistance to take the medication on time. Perfect, so definitely worth asking the question and having the conversation. Um, thank you, appreciate that. Patty, can you talk a little bit about family communication and how uh, a family, whether they live close or live far away, how, how other than getting a bill every month, how, mm -hmm. how does a family stay connected to the agency and know what's going on? Um, there's a, um, you know, every agency has their own um, technology um, that they use. And so we are seeing a lot more agencies have things called family portals, things like that, where they can um, get in through their computer to, to look at notes for the week, um, things like that. So there are those um, types of options. And then also, um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure I speak from all, probably all the, you know, agencies represented here this evening that um, having open door policy for families to call to, um, to get updates to, you know, you know, things that they just may not may have missed um, hearing from the caregiver, things like that. Um, we welcome those phone calls because we, of course, if this is all about trust for families. So um, we welcome those calls. Um, other agencies um, keep binders, those types of things where the caregivers can make um, daily, um, daily notes and the log notes to, um, to let ever, you know, let whoever may be looking through it know, you know, what the meals were, were meds taken, was there a shower, what other activities took place. So there's that. And then, you know, folk, folk, you know, family as they're coming in to visit are welcome to view those. Um, we do always, um, and just to, because the way the question is worded, we, 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 um, we always try to keep the, the questions coming through the office because we want the caregiver to be 100% focused on care of the, um, the individual in the home and not get bogged down with questions and trying to explain and um, things like that. So we, we always want those questions coming through the office as much as possible. Perfect, thanks. Um, and I, guys, I don't know that I had this question written down ahead of time, and, and this goes for home health uh, and home care, but um, can somebody talk a little bit about the training that the staff have? Can anybody just sign up to be an in-home care provider? How, how, how does that work? Who wants to take it? <laughs> well, I can take it. Um, Thanks, Angela. So it's it's not a job just for anybody. We do look for people, and I'm sure you know all home care agencies are looking for people that have the skills to provide the the kind of assistance. Now, a lot of what we're doing, housekeeping, meal preparation, um, you know, transportation. Yes, to some degree, that's something anyone can do, but. Uh, there does need to be training because we need to know how to work specifically with the elder population. Uh, so uh, we provide, you know, the home care agencies provide training. Uh, we have nurses on staff that provide hands-on training to our caregivers, teach them how to transfer, how to, uh, you know, uh, work with a wheelchair, a walker, and how to make keep the client safe when uh, using supportive devices. Um, a lot of us are, are using online training now to so that caregivers can uh, take specialized courses, maybe in uh, topics like dementia, uh, you know, dealing with people who have dementia, uh, you know, working with clients who have Parkinson's uh, disease, or you know, what to look for, uh, you know, what symptoms to look for if a person is uh, prone to having a stroke. So uh, there's a, a great deal of training and. Uh, and agencies will provide and require ongoing training for their caregivers. Um, my home health care folks, do, your, do the aides that go into the house for home health, do they have to be certified nursing assistants or do they have to have any special qualifications? I can speak to that. Thanks. They do need to have a certification and ongoing training. And as Angela had mentioned, specific to the population that we're working with and the environment that we're working in. 
for big things. And then of course, therapists, nurses, those are all credentialed and licensed professional staff. Um, uh, folks, those kind of round out the questions that I had for our panelists, but I wonder what other questions you might have. Again, I'll invite you to use the chat box. Um, folks, how about CPR? Is that something that is required training for uh, your staff? All of us. Yeah. Across the board. It's That's actually absolutely. required by the state. Okay. So, uh, you know, Angela, would you speak to that a little bit? Can anybody just open up a home care agency and start collecting money and sending people into houses? <laughs> Goodness, I hope not. <laughs> it feels that way sometimes because there are so many new agencies that have popped up out of nowhere. Um, but I think working with a reputable agency that has a history and has, you know, has been here is, is wise uh, because yes, there is, uh, you know, you do need to have a license. So to start a home care agency, uh, if you're going to provide personal care, you have to apply with the state. You have to uh, get licensed, get your RSA license. And that involves having someone come out and do a survey and they look very thoroughly at the office and at the files and you do have to have clients before they come out um, but they uh, you know they will look at what you're doing and make sure that uh, you have even before you start you have to have policies in place so they will will look at if you seem to know what you're doing uh, but that said i'm sure that there are people that think that it's easy i've known some people who started an agency and they were providing care themselves and and then trying to hire people to do what they couldn't do. And in some cases it didn't really end all that well. So, so really going with a licensed agency is highly recommended. Perfect. Actually, let me add to that if, if I, let me add to that if I may. Yes. One of the things with our, our folks out there is, whether it's in-home care or home health is the state of Maryland is probably the most, one of the most regulated organizations with across the country here itself. So what Angela was talking about, I know when we went after our license itself, it was exhaustive and very detail oriented. It was over a year plus before we could even open our business up. So, and we, there's also the opportunity where they can come in and audit us at any time here itself. So a lot of the folks that I know across the country in this type of business that we're in right now, Rest assured that Maryland is overlooking our shoulders very heavily. So the agency that you choose is a reputable one. Perfect. Um, I, I want to uh, just give a little information. Uh, so again, these are all uh, friends and colleagues. All of the folks on the call tonight are uh, members of the Frederick County Elder Services Provider Council, which is a a local networking group for all sorts of senior care professionals. And you can get a list of um, home care and home health care agencies that are ESPC members on our website, which is ESPCFrederick.com. Um, you can also get information about home care agencies and home health care agencies from uh, the Frederick County Division of Senior Services. Uh, they put out, and I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me to show you the blue book. Uh, it'll be coming out again soon. It's in uh, virtual format or in paper. It lists all the home care and home health care agencies along with lots of other senior care resources in Frederick. So if you'd like a copy, I am sure you can call Senior Services at 301-600-1234 to get a copy of that. Or I bet, Mary, you can confirm if they Google it or go to the Senior Services website, you can probably see that uh, digitally. Uh, but uh, again, making sure that you are going with an agency that is licensed and insured and reputable. Um, and again, all of my friends here on this call have been part of this community for a really, really uh, long time. Um, so here's a great question. Do all agencies have both male and female caregivers? So and I could answer this is this is yeah. Troy. I go ahead and answer that. I can't. I don't know if all of them do, but uh, we do, and I would imagine most of them do. The majority of our clients do prefer female caregivers, and I would say the bulk of our caregivers out there who work for us are females themselves. But we do have a number of males that can also provide that service. Um, Tim has given, Tim, this is a fantastic question. So most of the discussion seems like the aid helps an elderly person living alone. Can you have an aid coming into your house when there's an able-bodied spouse there too? 
Yeah, I'll take that one. I, I saw that question and I thought that that was, that was a great question because we, we really do focus on hearing to freeze up a little bit. Eileen, we are losing your audio, and I know that this is a great answer that you are trying to provide. Oh, no. Okay, try it again. That's all right. No, that's all right. How about now? Yeah. Okay, is that better? Yes. All right, I'll let one of my colleagues, if not, I'll let somebody else answer it. No, we can hear you. Go ahead. All right, somebody else want to jump on and answer that question about working in a house when there's an able-bodied spouse there? How does that work? Well, we are there to provide respite for the able-bodied spouse. It's very important um, for family caregivers to have some time to themselves so that they don't burn out or get injured from uh, providing care. So when there's an able-bodied spouse, um, they're, they're part of the care team and they can benefit from uh, the services the aid provides. Uh, your home care aid is not going, to, is going to, to be there for both people to some degree. So um, incidental care for the other person, like if they're doing laundry, they're not going to say, well, I'm not going to wash this sock because it's yours, you know. So they, they'll help, you know, with laundry that if they prepare a meal, they can prepare enough for two. And that's incidental, so it, it may not rise to the level of couple care. But when, as uh, I think someone said earlier, when two members of a couple are both getting, uh, you know, services, then that can affect the rate. Um, but the able-bodied spouse can take time for him or herself to go out and do something, or um, some people are working from home, or, or just take some time in another room to take a nap or to take a break. Or, or to be part of the conversation, that's welcome too. Perfect. Um, I do want to point out, Mary Collins has put a link in the chat box, folks. If you, again, go to that chat, uh, she put the link to get the Frederick County Blue Book, the resource guide for seniors. Uh, and again, it lists all things senior related here in Frederick County, including home care and home health uh, care agencies. Um, another question about security. Um, are employees of the agencies fingerprinted? Is that part of the background check? Uh, and it, is Adult Protective Services have any role in that? I, I can't speak for any other agencies. We don't fingerprint, but we do a thorough background check that looks at uh, uh, federal, state, and county uh, court records. So. Um, there are, are some background checks that may include fingerprinting, uh, but I think that's, you know, depends on the agency. Um, I'm not sure that Adult Protective Services has any role in it. So they don't, um, you know, certify people or anything like that. But our, our aides are trained in recognizing signs of elder abuse. Uh, you know, we are mandatory reporters, so we, we do need to be aware of, of that possibility. And, uh, you know, we, um, may at times have to make reports to Adult Protective Services if something doesn't seem right. Perfect. Thanks, Angela. Anybody have any other questions? Or panelists, have, have, can you think of anything that we haven't covered that would be helpful for our viewers? I was oh, just really? going to say, like to... we have been talking <laughs> Go ahead, about, oh, sorry. no, I'm sorry, we've been talking about providing care to seniors and seniors are very important, but most of us do provide care for people who are adults 18 and older. Interesting distinction. Thank you. Um, so that could be someone who's uh, just maybe, uh, well, I guess if they've just had surgery, that might be home health, but um, somebody that's just recovering or maybe home with a new baby or something that, that services through one of your agencies might be appropriate? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, I would like to thank again all of our panelists uh, again uh, for an excellent job. Angela Martin from Shepherd Staff in Home Care, Ty Tawney from Home Call uh, Home Health Care, Troy Rudy from Assisting Hands Home Care, Chris King from Bayada Home Health, Eileen McLaughlin from Right at Home Home Care, um, Desiree Dimapan from Emeticis Home Health, and Patty Smith from Home Instead. So 
thank you again to all of you. Thank you for our guests who are here listening tonight. Um, I do want to go ahead and let you know our next webinar in the Compass for Caregivers series is going to be on September 9th. Um, we've got great topics booked all the way through December, but September 9th from 7 to 8, we'll be talking about Medicare and open enrollment. So uh, if you yourself are new to Medicare or if you're trying to manage your loved one's Medicare, um, there are a lot of rules and regulation and things that you have to do annually uh, that are really important uh, and will help save you money. So you'll want to tune in with uh, Ellie Williams from Frederick County Senior Services is going to be our speaker to talk more about uh, Medicare and making sure that you have the right Medicare plan. Uh, so September 9th, um, I will open that registration uh, momentarily. We'll have that ready to go. So you can go to espcfrederick.com and click on the caregiver education tab. Um, the flyer that's there right now is out of date. I know that, but if you click on the register link, it will be current and you will get the link. Um, thank you. This uh, recording will be available on the ESPC website very soon. Um, I will also share the information with those of you that are here tonight. We can send out the link. But again, everybody, thank you. Have a great night. Stay cool. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, guys, we're clear. clear. Oh, another one. Well yeah. done. Thanks, guys. And, uh, you know, not counting Mary, we only had uh, eight participants. I know. I'm so, I, I don't know. I would love it if, and I'm preaching to the choir here because you all have a big role um, on this committee, but I would love it if we could squeeze an arm, Bonnie, somebody to help manage. Um, I'm stop recording. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>